Hello everyone, it's Pastor Dan again, and uh, I'm continuing my reading of The Chronicles of Narnia, book number three, The Horse and His Boy. We are on chapter 12, Shasta in Narnia. Was it all a dream? wondered Shasta. But it couldn't have been a dream, for there in the grass before him he saw the deep, large print of the lion's front right paw. It took one's breath away to think of the weight that could make a footprint like that. But there was something more remarkable than the size about it. As he looked at it, water had already filled the bottom of it. Soon it was full to the brim, and then overflowing, and a little stream was running downhill past him over the grass. Shasta stooped and drank, a very long drink, and then dipped his face in and splashed his head. It was extremely cold and clear as glass, and refreshed him very much. After that he stood up, shaking the water out of his ears and flinging the wet hair back from his forehead, and began to take stock of his surroundings. Apparently it was still very early morning. The sun had only just risen, and it had risen out of the forests which he saw low down and far away on his right. The country which he was looking at was absolutely new to him. It was a green valley land dotted with trees through which he caught the gleam of a river that wound away roughly to the northwest. On the far side of the valley there were high and even rocky hills, but they were lower than the mountains he had seen yesterday. Then he began to guess where he was. He turned and looked behind him and saw that the slope on which he was standing belonged to a range of far higher mountains. I see, said Shasta to himself. Those are the big mountains between Arkenland and Narnia. I was on the other side of them yesterday. I must have come through the pass in the night. What luck that I hit it! At least, it wasn't really luck at all, really. It was him. And now I'm in Narnia. He turned and unsaddled his horse and took off its bridle, though you are a perfectly horrid horse, he said. It took no notice of this remark, and immediately began eating grass. That horse had a very low opinion of Shasta. I wish I could eat grass, thought Shasta. It's no good going back to Anvard. It'll all be besieged. I'd better get lower down into the valley and see if I can get anything to eat. So he went on downhill. The thick dew was cruelly cold to his bare feet, till he came into a wood. There was a kind of track running through it, and he had not followed this for many minutes when he heard a thick and rather wheezy voice saying to him, Good morning, neighbor. Shasta looked round eagerly to find the speaker, and presently saw a small prickly person with a dark face who had just come out from among the trees. At least, it was small for a person, but very big indeed for a hedgehog, which is what it was. "'Good morning,' said Shasta. "'But I'm not a neighbor. In fact, I'm a stranger in these parts.' "'Ah?' said the hedgehog, inquiringly. "'I've come over the mountains from Arkenland, you know.' "'Ah, Arkenland,' said the hedgehog. "'That's a terrible long way. I ain't never been there myself.' "'And I think, perhaps,' said Shasta, "'someone ought to be told that there's an army of savage calamines attacking Anvard at this very moment.' "'You don't say so,' answered Hedgehog. "'Well, think of that. "'And they do say that Callerman is hundreds of miles "'and thousands of miles away, "'right at the world's end, across a great sea of sand.' "'It's not nearly as far as you think,' said Shasta. "'And oughtn't something to be done about this attack on Anvard? "'Oughtn't your high king to be told?' "'Certain, sure, something ought to be done about it,' said the Hedgehog. But you see, I'm just on my way to bed for a good day's sleep. Hello, neighbor. The last words were addressed to an immense biscuit-colored rabbit, whose head had just popped up from somewhere beside the path. The hedgehog immediately told the rabbit what it had just learned from Shasta. The rabbit agreed that this was very remarkable news, and that somebody ought to tell somebody about it with a view to doing something. And so it went on. 
Every few minutes they were joined by other creatures, some from the branches overhead and some from little underground houses at their feet, till the party consisted of five rabbits, a squirrel, two magpies, a goat-foot fawn, and a mouse, who all talked at the same time and all agreed with the hedgehog. For the truth was that in that golden age, when the witch and the winter had gone and Peter the High King ruled at Caer Paravel, the smaller woodland people of narnia were so safe and happy that they were getting a little careless presently however two more practical people arrived in the little wood one was a red dwarf whose name appeared to be duffle the other was a stag a beautifully lordly creature with wide liquid eyes dappled flanks and legs so thin and graceful that they looked as if you could break them with two fingers "'Lion alive!' roared the dwarf as soon as he heard the news. "'And if that's so, why are we all standing still chattering? "'Enemies at Anvar, news must be sent to Carparavel at once. "'The army must be called out. "'Narnia must go to the aid of King Loon.' "'Ah!' said the hedgehog. "'But you won't find the king, the high king, at Care. "'He's away north trouncing those giants.' And talking of giant neighbors, that puts me in mind. Who'll take our message? interrupted the dwarf. Anyone here got more speed than me? I've got speed, said the stag. What's my message? How many calamines? Two hundred under Prince Rabidash and... But the stag was already away. All four legs off the ground at once, and in a moment its white stern had disappeared among the remoter trees. "'Wonder where he's going,' said a rabbit. "'He won't find the High King at Care Paravel, you know.' "'He'll find Queen Lucy,' said Duffle. "'And then, hello, what's wrong with the human? "'It looks pretty green. "'Why, I do believe it's quite faint. "'Perhaps it's mortal hungry. "'When did you last have a meal, youngster?' "'Yesterday morning,' said Shasta, weakly. "'Come on, then, come on,' said the dwarf, "'at once throwing his thick little arms around Shasta's waist to support him.' Why, neighbors, we all ought to be ashamed of ourselves. You come with me, lad. Breakfast better than talking. With a great deal of bustle, muttering reproaches to itself, the dwarf half led and half supported Shasta at a great speed further into the wood and a little downhill. It was a longer walk than Shasta wanted at that moment, and his legs had begun to feel very shaky before they came out from the trees to on to bare hillside. There they found a little house with a smoking chimney and an open door, and as they came to the doorway, Duffle called out, Hey, brothers, a visitor for breakfast! And immediately, mixed with a sizzling sound, there came to Shasta a simply delightful smell. It was one he had never smelt in his life before, but I hope you have. It was, in fact, the smell of bacon and eggs and mushrooms all in a frying pan. Mind your head, lad, said Duffle a moment too late for Shasta had already bashed his forehead against the low lintel of the door. Now, continued the dwarf, sit you down. There's a, the table's a bit low for you, but then the stool's low too. That's right. And here's porridge, and here's a jug of cream, and here's a spoon. By the time Shasta had finished his porridge, the dwarf's two brothers, whose names were Rogan and Bricklethumb, were putting the dish of bacon and eggs and mushrooms and the coffee pot and the hot milk and the toast on the table, it was all new and wonderful to Shasta, for calamine food is quite different. He didn't even know what the slices of brown stuff were, were, for he'd never seen toast before. He didn't know what the yellow soft thing they smeared on the toast was, because in calamine you nearly always got oil instead of butter. And the house itself was quite different from the dark, frowsy, sm fish-smelling hut of Arshish, and from the pillared and carpeted halls in the palaces of Tashban. The roof was very low, and everything was made of wood, and there was a cuckoo clock, and a red and white checked tablecloth, and a bowl of wild flowers, and little curtains on the thick paned windows. It was also rather troublesome having to use dwarf cups, and plates, and knives, and forks. This meant that the helpings were very small, but then there were a good many helpings, so that Shasta's plate or cup was being filled every moment, and every moment the dwarves themselves were saying, Butter, please, or another cup of coffee, or I'd like a few more mushrooms, or what about frying another egg or so? And when at last they had all eaten as much as they could possibly, they could possibly, the three dwarfs drew lots for who would do the washing up. 
and Rogan was the unlikely, unlucky one. Then Duffel and Bricklethumb took Shasta outside to a bench which ran against the cottage wall, and they all stretched out their legs and gave a great sigh of contentment, and the two dwarfs lit their pipes. The dew was off the grass now, and the sun was warm. Indeed, if there hadn't been a light breeze, it would have been too hot. Now, stranger, said Duffel, I'll show you the lie of the land. You can see nearly all South Narnia from here, and we're rather proud of the view. Right away on your left, beyond those near hills, you can just see the western mountains. And that, round the hill on away on your right, is called the Hill of the Stone Table. Just beyond. But that that moment he was interrupted by a snore from Shasta, who, what with his night's journey and his excellent breakfast, had fallen fast asleep. The kindly dwarfs, as soon as they noticed this, began making signs to each other not to wake him, and indeed did so much whispering and nodding and getting up and tiptoeing away that they certainly would have waked him if he had been less tired. He slept pretty well nearly all day, but woke up in time for supper. The beds in that house were all far too small for him, but they made him a fine bed of heather on the floor, and he never stirred nor dreamed all night. Next morning, they had just finished breakfast when they heard a shrill, exciting noise from uh, exciting sound from outside. Trumpets! said all the dwarfs, as they and Shasta all came running out. The trumpets sounded again, a new noise to Shasta, not huge and solemn like the horns of Tashman, nor gay and merry like King Loon's hunting horn, but clear and sharp and valiant. The noise was coming from the woods to the east, and soon there was a noise of hoofs, horse hoofs mixed with it. A moment later, the head of the column came into sight. First came the Lord Paradin on a bay horse carrying the great banner of Narnia, a red lion on a green ground. Shasta knew him at once. Then came three people riding abreast, two on great chargers and one on a pony. The two on the chargers were King Edmund and a fair-haired lady with a very merry face, who wore a helmet and a male shirt and carried a bow across her shoulder and a quiver full of arrows at her side. The Queen Lucy whispered Duffel. But the one on the pony was Corin. After that came the main body of the army, men on ordinary horses, men on talking horses, who didn't mind being written, ridden on proper occasions, as when Narnia went to war. Centaurs, stern, hard-bitten bears, great talking dogs, and last of all, six giants. For there are good giants in Narnia. But though he knew they were on the right side, Shasta at first could hardly bear to look at them. There are some things that take a lot of getting used to. Just as the king and queen reached the cottage and the dwarfs began making low bows to them, King Edmund called out, Now, friends, time for a halt and a morsel. And at once there was a great bustle of people dismounting and haversacks being opened and conversation beginning when Corin came running up to Shasta and seized both his hands and cried, What? You here? So you got through all right? I am glad. Now we shall have some sport, and isn't it luck? We only got into harbour at Care Paravel yesterday morning, and the very first person who met us was Chervy the Stag, with all his this news of an attack on Anvard. Don't you think? Who is your highness's friend? said King Edmund, who had just got off his horse. Don't you see, sire? said Corin. It's my double, the boy you mistook for me at Tashman. Why, so he is your double, exclaimed Queen Lucy, as like as two twins. This is a marvellous thing. Please, your majesty, said Shasta to King Edmund, I was no traitor, really I wasn't, and I couldn't help, help hearing your plans, but I'd never dreamed of telling them to your enemies. I know now that you were no traitor, boy, said King Edmund, laying his hand on Shasta's head, but if you would not be taken for one another time, try not to hear what's meant for other ears. And all's well. After that, there was so much bustle and talk and coming and going that Shasta for a few minutes lost sight of Corin and Edmund and Lucy. But Corin was the sort of boy whom one is sure to hear of pretty soon, and it wasn't very long before Shasta heard King Edmund saying in a loud voice, By the lion's mane, prince, this is too much! Will your highness never be better? You are more of a heart-scald than our whole army together! 
I'd as lief have a regiment of hornets in my command as you. Shasta wormed his way through the crowd, and there saw Edmund looking very angry indeed, Corin looking a little ashamed of himself, and a strange dwarf sitting on the ground making faces. A couple of fawns had apparently just been helping it out of its armor. If I had but my cordial with me, Queen Lucy was saying, I could soon mend this. The High King has so strictly charged me not to carry it commonly to the wars and to keep it only for great extremities. What had happened was this. As soon as Corin had spoken to Shasta, Corin's elbow had been plucked by a dwarf in the army called Thornbutt. What is it, Thornbutt? Corin had, Corin had said. Your Royal Highness, said Thornbutt, drawing him aside, our march today will bring us through the pass and right to your royal father's castle. We may be in battle before night. I know, said Corin. Isn't it splendid? Splendid or not, said Thornbutt, I have the strictest orders from King Edmund to see to it that your Highness is not in the fight. You will be allowed to see it, and that's treat enough for your Highness's little years. Oh, what nonsense, Corin burst out. Of course I'm going to fight. Why, the Queen Lucy's going to be with the archers. The Queen's Grace will do as she pleases, said Thornbutt, but you are in my charge. Either I must have your solemn and princely word that you'll keep your pony beside mine, not a half a neck ahead, till I give your highness leave to depart, or else, it is his majesty's word, we must go with our wrists tied together like two prisoners. I'll knock you down if you try to bind me, said Corn. I'd like to see your highness do it said the dwarf. That was quite enough for a boy like Corin, and in a second he and the dwarf were all at it, hammer and tongs. It would have been an even match, for though Corin had longer arms and more height, the dwarf was older and tougher, but it was never fought out, that's the worst of fights on a rough hillside, for by very bad luck Thornbud trod on a loose stone, came flat down on his nose, and found when he tried to get up that he had sprained his ankle, a really excruciating sprain which would keep him from walking or riding for at least a fortnight. See what your highness has done, said King Edmund, deprived us of a proved warrior on the edge of battle. I'll take his place, sire, said Corin. Pshaw, said Edmund, no one doubts your courage, but a boy in battle is a danger only to his own side. At that moment the king was called away to attend to something else, and Corin, after apologizing handsomely to the dwarf, rushed up to Shasta and whispered, Quick, there's a spare pony now, and if and the dwarf's armor, put it on before anyone notices. What for? said Shasta. Why, so that you can I, you and I can fight in the battle, of course. Don't you want to? Oh, uh, yes, of course, said Shasta. But he hadn't been thinking of doing so at all, and began to get most a most uncomfortable, prickly feeling in his spine. That's right, said Gorin, over your head, now the sword belt, but we must ride near the tail of the column and keep as quiet as mice. Once the battle begins, everyone will be far too busy to notice us. And that is the end of chapter 12. Chapter 13. The Fight at Anvard by about eleven o'clock, the whole company was once more on the march, riding westward with the mountains on their left. Corin and Shasta rode right at the rear, with the giants immediately in front of them. Lucy and Edmund and Peridin were busy with their plans for the battle, and though once Lucy once said, But where is his goosecap highness? Edmund only replied, Not in the front, and that's good news enough. Leave well alone. Shasta told Corin most of his adventures, and explained that he had learned all his riding from a horse and didn't really know how to use the reins. Corin instructed him in this, besides telling him all about their secret sailing from Tashman. "'And where is King's Queen Susan?' "'At Care Paravel,' said Corin. "'She's not like Lucy, you know, who's as good as a man, or at any rate as good as a boy. Queen Susan is more like an ordinary grown-up lady.' She doesn't ride to the wars, though she is an excellent archer. The hillside path which they were following became narrower all the time, and the drop on their right hand became steeper. At last they were going in single file along the edge of a precipice, and Shasta shuddered to think that he had done the same thing last night without knowing it. But of course he thought, I was quite safe. That is why the lion kept on my left. 
He was between me and the edge. Then the path went left and south away from the cliff, and there were thick woods on both sides of it, and they went steeply up and up into the pass. There would have been a splendid view from the top if it were open ground, but among all those trees you could see nothing, only every now and then some huge pinnacle of rock above the treetops and an eagle or two wheeling high up in the blue air. They smell battle said Corin, pointing at the birds. They know we're preparing a feed for them. Shasta didn't like this at all. When they had crossed the neck of the pass and come a good deal lower, they reached more open ground, and from here Shasta could see all Arkenland, blue and hazy, spread out below him, and even, he thought, a hint of the desert beyond it. But the sun, which had perhaps two hours or so to go before it was set, was in his eyes, and he couldn't make things out distinctly. Here the army halted and spread out in a line, and there was a great deal of rearranging. A whole detachment of very dangerous-looking talking beasts whom Shasta had not noticed before, and who were mostly of the cat kind, leopards, panthers, and the like, went padding and growling to take up their positions on the left. The giants were ordered to the right, and before going there they all took off something they had been carrying on their backs and sat down for a moment. Then Shasta saw what they had been carrying and were now putting on were pairs of boots. Horrid, heavy, spiked boots which came up to their knees. Then they sloped their huge clubs over their shoulders and marched to their battle position. The archers, with Queen Lucy, fell to the rear, and you could first see them bending their bows, and then hear the twang-twang as they tested the strings. And wherever you looked, you could see people tightening girths, putting on helmets, drawing swords, and throwing cloaks to the ground. There was hardly any talking now. It was very solemn and very dreadful. I'm in for it now. I really am in for it, thought Shasta. Then there came noises far ahead, the sound of many men shouting, and a steady thud, thud, thud. Battering ram, whispered Corin. They're battering the gate. Even Corin looked quite serious now. Why doesn't King Edmund get on, he said. I can't stand this waiting about. Chilly, too. Shasta nodded, hoping he didn't look as frightened as he felt. The trumpet, at last... On the move now, now trotting, the banner streaming out in the wind. They had topped a low ridge now, and below them the whole scene suddenly opened out, a little many-towered castle with its gates towards them. No moat, unfortunately, but of course the gate with its gate with shut and the portcullis down. On the walls they could see, like little white dots, the faces of the defenders. Down below, about fifty of the Calermines, dismounted, were steadily swinging a great tree trunk against the gate. But at once the scene changed. The main bulk of Rabidash's men had been on foot, ready to assault the gate, but now he had seen the Narnian sweeping down from the ridge. There is no doubt those Calermines are wonderfully trained. It seemed to Shasta only a second before the whole line of the enemy were on horseback again, wheeling round to meet them, swinging towards them. And now a gallop. The ground between the two armies grew less every moment, faster, faster. All swords out now, all shields up to the nose, all prayers said, all teeth clenched. Shasta was dreadfully frightened. But it suddenly came into his head, if you funk this, you'll funk every battle all your life, now or never. But when at last the two lines met, he had really very little idea of what happened. There was a frightful confusion and an appalling noise. His sword was knocked clean out of his hand pretty soon, and he'd got the reins tangled somehow. Then he found himself slipping. Then a spear came straight at him, and as he ducked to avoid it, he rolled right off his horse, bashed his left knuckles terribly against someone else's armor, and then... But it is no use trying to describe the battle from Shaston's point of view. He understood too little of the fight in general, and even of his own part in it. 
The best way I can tell you what really happened is to take you some miles away to where the hermit of the southern march sat gazing into his smooth pool beneath the spreading tree with Bree and Wynne and Erevis beside him. For it was in this pool that the hermit looked when he wanted to know what was going on in the world outside the green walls of his hermitage. There, as in a mirror, he could see, at certain times, what was going on in the streets of cities far further south than Tashban, or what whips were putting into Red Haven in the remote Seven Isles, or what robbers or wild beasts stirred in the great western forests between Lestern, Lantern Waste and Telmar, and all this day he had hardly left his pool even to eat or drink, for he knew that great events were afoot in Arkenland. Erebus and the horses gazed into it, too. They could see it was a magic pool. Instead of reflecting the tree and the sky, it revealed cloudy and colored shapes, moving, always moving, in its depths. But they could see nothing clearly. The hermit could, and from time to time he told them what he saw. A little while before Shasta rode into his first battle, the hermit had begun speaking like this. I see one, two, three eagles wheeling in the gap by Stormness Head. One is the oldest of all the eagles. He would not be out unless battle was at hand. I see him wheel to and fro, peering down sometimes at Anvard and sometimes to the east behind Stormness. Ah, I see now what Rabidash and his men have been so busy at all day. They have felled and lopped a great tree, and now they are coming out of the woods, carrying it as a ram. They have learned something from the failure of last night's assault. He would have been wiser if he had set his men to making ladders, but it takes too long, and he is impatient. Fool that he is. He ought to have ridden back to Tashban as soon as the first attack failed, for his whole plan depended on speed and surprise. Now they are bringing their ram into position. King Loon's men are shooting hard from the walls. Five Calamines have fallen, but not many will. They have their shields above their heads. Rabidash is giving his orders now. With him are his most trusted lords, fierce Tarkins from the eastern provinces. I can see their faces. There is Corridan of Castle Tormunt, and Azru, and uh, Tlamash, and Ilgl... Ilgamoth Il of the Twisted Lip, and a tall Tarkin with a crimson beard. "'By the mane, my old master Enradin,' said Bree. "'Shh,' said Erebus. "'Now the ram has started. "'If I could hear as well as see what a noise that would make. "'Stroke after stroke, and no gate can stand it forever. "'But wait, something up by Stormness has scared the birds. "'They're coming out in masses. "'Wait again. I can't see yet.' Ah, now I can. The whole ridge upon the east is black with horsemen. If only the wind would catch that standard and spread it out. They're over the ridge now, whoever they are. Aha! I've seen the banner now. Narnia! Narnia! It's the Red Lion. They're in full career down the hill now. I can see King Edmund. There's a woman behind among the archers. Oh! What is it? asked Twin breathlessly. All his cats are dashing out from the left of the line. Cats? said Erebus. Great cats, leopards and such, said the hermit impatiently. I see, I see. The cats are coming round in a circle to get at the horses of the dismounted men. A good stroke. The Calamine horses are mad with terror already. Now the cats are in among them. But Rabidash has reformed his line and has a hundred men in the saddle. They're riding to meet the Narnians. There's only a hundred yards between the two lines now. Only fifty. I can see King Edmund. I can see the Lord Peridin. There are two mere children in the Narnian line. What can the king be about to let them into battle? Only ten yards. The lines have met. The giants on the Narnian right are doing wonders. But one's down, shot through the eye, I suppose. The center's all in a muddle. I can see more on the left. There are the two boys again. Lion alive! One is Prince, Prince Corin, the other like him as two peas. It's your Shasta. Corin is fighting like a man. He's killed a Calamine. I can see a bit of the center now. Rabidash and Edmund almost met then, but the press has separated them. What about Shasta? Erebus said. Oh, the fool, groaned the hermit. 
Poor brave little fool. He knows nothing about his work. He's making no use at all of his shield. His whole side's exposed. He hasn't the faintest idea what to do with his sword. Oh, he's remembered now. He's waving it wildly about. Nearly cut his own pony's head off. And he will in a moment if he's not careful. It's been knocked out of his hand now. It's mere murder sending a child like that into battle. He can't live five minutes. Dark, you fool. Oh, he's down. Killed? said three voices breathlessly. How could I tell? said the hermit. The cats have done their work. All the riderless horses are dead or escaped now. No retreat for the Calarmines on them. Now the cats are turning back into the main battle. They're leaping on the ramsmen. The ram is down. Oh, good, good. The gates are opening from the inside. There's going to be a sortie. The first three are out. It's King Loon in the middle. The brothers Dar and Darren on each side of him. Behind him are Tran and Shar and Cole with his brother Colin. There are ten, twenty, nearly thirty of them out by now. The Calermain line is being forced back upon them. King Edmund is dealing marvelous strokes. He's just slashed Corden's head off. Lots of Calermines have thrown down their arms and are running for the woods. Those that remain are hard-pressed. The giants are closing in on the right, cats on the left, King Loon from the rear. The Calermines are a little knot now, fighting back to back. Your Tarkin's down, Bree. Loon and Azru are fighting hand to hand. The king looks like winning. The king is keeping it up well. The king has won. Azru's down. King Edmund down. No, he's up again. He's at it with Rabidash. They're fighting in the very gate of the castle. Several Calermines have surrendered. Darren has killed Ilgamoth. I can't see what happened to Rabidash. I think he's dead, leaning against the castle wall, but I don't know. Shalamash and King Edmund are still fighting, but the battle is over everywhere else. Shalamash has surrendered. The battle is over. The Calarmines are utterly defeated. When Shasta fell off his horse, he gave himself up for lost. But horses, even in battle, tread on human beings very much less than you would suppose. After a very horrible ten minutes or so, Shasta realized suddenly that there were no longer any horses stamping about in the immediate neighborhood, and that the noise, for there were still a good many noises going on, was no longer that of battle. He sat up and stared about him. Even he, little as he knew of battles, could see soon see that the Arkenlanders and Narnians had won. The only living Calermans he could see were prisoners. The castle gates were wide open, and King Loon and King Edmund were shaking hands across the battering ram. From the circle of lords and warriors around them, there rose a sound of breathless and excited but obviously cheerful conversation. And then, suddenly, it all united and swelled into a great roar of laughter. Shasta picked himself up, feeling uncommonly stiff, and ran towards the sound to see what the joke was. A very curious sight met his eyes. The unfortunate Rabidash appeared to be suspended from the castle walls. <coughs> Excuse me. His feet, which were about two feet from the ground, were kicking wildly. His chain shirt was somehow hitched up so that it was horribly tight under the arms, and came halfway over his face. In fact, he looked just as a man looks if you catch him in the very act of getting into a stiff shirt that is a little too small for him. As far as he as could be made out afterwards, and you may be sure the story was well talked over for many a day, what happened was something like this. Early in the battle, one of the giants had made an unsuccessful stamp at Rabidash with his spiked boot. Unsuccessful because it didn't crush Rabidash, which was what the giant had intended, but not quite useless, because one of the spikes tore the chain mail, just as you or I might tear an ordinary shirt. So Rabidash, by the time he encountered Edmund at the gate, had a hole in the back of his hauberk. And when Edmund pressed him back nearer and nearer to the wall, he jumped up on a mounting block and stood there raining down blows on Edmund from above. But then, Finding that this position, by raising him above the heads of everyone else, made him a mark for every arrow from the Narnian bows, he decided to jump down again. And he meant to look around, look and sound, no doubt 
for a moment he did look and sound very grand and very dreadful as he jumped crying the bolt of tash falls from above but he had to jump sideways because the crowd in front of him left no landing place in that direction and then <coughs> in the neatest way you could wish the tear in the back of his hauberk caught on a hook in the wall ages ago this hook had had a ring in it for tying horses to and there he found himself like a piece of washing hung up to dry with everyone laughing at him let me down edmund howled rabidash let me down and fight me like a king and a man or if you are too great a coward to do that kill me at once certainly began king edmund but king loon interrupted by your majesty's leave said king loon to edmund not so then turning to rabidash he said your royal highness if you had given that challenge a week ago i'll answer for it there was there was no king in edmund's dominion from the high king down to the smallest talking mouse who would have refused it but by attacking our, attacking our castle of anvard in time of peace without defiance sent you have proved yourself no knight but a traitor and one rather to be whipped by the hangman than to be suffered to cross swords with any person of honour take him down bind him and carry him within our within till our pre pleasure is further known strong hands wrenched rabidash's sword from him and he was carried away into the castle shouting threatening cursing and even crying for though he could have faced torture he couldn't bear being made ridiculous in tashban everyone had always taken him seriously at that moment corin ran up to shasta seized his hand and started dragging him towards king loon here he is father here he is cried corin ay and here thou art at last said the king in a very gruff voice and has been in the battle clean and contrary to your obedience a boy to break a father's heart at your age a rod to your breech were fitter than a sword in your fist ha but everyone including corin could see that the king was very proud of him chide him no more sire if it please you said lord darren his highness would not be your son if he did not inherit your conditions it would grieve your majesty more if he had be, had to be reproved for the opposite fault well well grumbled the king we'll pass it over for this time and now what came next surprised shasta as much as anything that he had ever, that had ever happened to him in his life he found himself suddenly embraced in a bear-like hug by king loon and kissed on both cheeks and the king set him down and said stand here together boys and let all the court see you hold up your heads now gentlemen look on them both has any man any doubts and still shasta could not understand why everyone stared at him and at corin nor what all the cheering was about and that is the end of chapter thirteen join me tomorrow for uh, chapters fourteen and fifteen and the exciting conclusion of the horse and his boy